Willem, je gaat zo meteen Peter Diamantus interviewen. Wat voor vraag heb je voor hem? Ik ga hem keurig de vragen stellen die jij me voorgesteld hebt dat ik die moet vragen. En dat zijn uh, mild kritische vragen. Noem eens wat. Nou kijk, um, hij zegt dus dat er kansen zijn uh, voor enorme, uh, uh, laten we zeggen, voor oplossingen van een aantal grote problemen die we hebben. Het energieprobleem, allerlei uh, problemen met drinkwater met name. En hij denkt dat het mogelijk is om de het miljard armste mensen, de miljard armste mensen, om die in de komende jaren een veel beter leven te geven op allerlei gebieden. We moeten gaan beginnen. Ga je gang. En geloof je dat? Natuurlijk niet. Oké. Okay. Zo, we hebben hier Peter Diamantus die binnenkomt. En we gaan nu eens even met nieuwsuur gaan we hem interviewen. Peter krijgt even informatie dat dit gewoon wel het theatergrond aller tijden is. Ja, voor plug in met de business community en... Should have some fun of how you. This is a part, I, this is a party time. You, I'll be back again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 remember that it's important. Okay. I. Uh, hello. Okay. Um, I, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Because. <laughs> I'm glad I'm here too. <laughs> we need some optimism. All right. Because the whole country seems to be in a deep depression. Like an improvement in human life. Um, over the last hundred years, the human lifespan has more than doubled. The income for every country on the planet adjusted for inflation has more than tripled. The cost of food has dropped 13-fold. The cost of energy has dropped 20-fold. The cost of transportation 100-fold. Steven Pinker at Harvard just wrote a book that shows us we're living during the most peaceful time ever in human history. Your chances of dying a violent death are one five hundredth of what they used to be. Thank you. And, you know, the fact of the matter is... What's made that world better isn't better politicians, it's not we've gotten smarter, it's been the impact of technology. Technology has transformed this planet, taken that which was scarce and made it abundant. And guess what? The rate at which technology is impacting our lives is increasing. Now, that scares people, it, it, it too. Will, it will continue, you mean? It not only will continue, it will increase. So, what do I mean by that? Um, At the XPRIZE Foundation, which I serve as Chairman and CEO of, last year we announced something called the Qualcomm Tricorder XPRIZE. Qualcomm is the company that funded $20 million of prizes for the team that could build a handheld mobile device that any mom or dad could use at 2 o'clock in the morning when their kid is sick. And this is a device you can talk to. It's got artificial intelligence, understands what you're saying. You can cough on it, and it can do a... DNA or RNA analysis of the bacteria in your, in your saliva. You could do a finger blood prick. Anyway, the notion is that this device can diagnose you better than a team of doctors. That's the direction we're going in, where healthcare will effectively become free and ubiquitous. So will uh, our educational and learning systems. You know, the technology is going to help us meet our basic needs, food, water, shelter, learning, healthcare, you know, communications. Can, uh, can we deal with all those changes? You kind of suggested we, so, we, 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 we might be scared by it. Well, we, we, most people are. You know, we like going to sleep and waking up the next morning knowing that the world is the same way it was the night before. And when the, the world is changing so fast, we get scared by it. But I tell you what, I remember going to my parents and saying, Mom, Dad, this is email. You know, this is a digital phone. You need one of these. This is a digital camera. You need one of these. And they're like, what do I need that for? And today, you know, I can't take it away from them. And that's the way we are, right? And all of this technology that we use today that we don't think twice of, the, the cell phone that's got two-way video Skype on it, you know, uh, it's got libraries of books and music, and you can talk to it and it answers you. These are things that we don't force on people. People get it, they start using it, and then you can't take it away from them. Technology, when it starts improving the quality of our life, is something that we become dependent on all of a sudden. No, no, we're in the middle of this revolution. Let's, let's call it the revolution. We're in the very beginning. We're not in the middle. We're in the very beginning of this technological revolution. Uh, how is it possible that for the last few years in Europe, in the United States, North America, the economy has been in the doldrums? How is it possible? So, listen, we are, um, over the last hundred years that I mentioned that the world has gotten incredibly better, during those hundred years, we also had World War I, World War II, the Spanish flu, Re recessions, depressions, all kinds of turmoil. And 
you know, this road forward is not always smooth. There is chaos on the road. There is problems. There's going to be issues. But the fact of the matter is that the ability for people to have a life that is more and more capable, to have more access to more energy, more clean water, more health care, is the direction that we're heading. You know, I know the numbers for the U.S. I don't know them here for, uh, for the Netherlands or Europe. But in the United States today, the poorest of the poor, people below the poverty level, right, 98% uh, have a flushing toilet, running water, a roof over their head, 88% have air conditioning, a car, and a mobile phone. These are the people under the poverty level. The kings and queens didn't have this 100 years ago, right? And yet the poorest have this today. We're moving the poverty level. We're moving what that means. And so our expectations grow, sometimes faster than, than the economy, sometimes faster than the technology. But the fact of the matter is, our ability to live, not a life of luxury, I'm not promising a life of luxury here, what we're talking about is technology giving us a life of possibility, where we have access to the best education in the world, the best health care in the world. Because on your smartphone today, if you have Google, you have access to all the world's information, better than the president of, you know, of of any country had just 20 years ago or 10 years ago. What do you worry about? What might come in the way? So listen, these technologies are always can do harm as well as good, of course. Uh, I happen to think and believe in the better side of human nature, and I think these technologies actually help us spot people who might want to do evil. Um, I worry about governments thinking they can regulate against it, because they cannot. You know, in the United States... They might States, try to. They might try to, and all that does is depress that country. So uh, as an example, back uh, got 20 years now when Bush 43, the second President Bush, made uh, fetal stem cell research illegal in the United States, putting aside the moral issues there. When he made that illegal in the United States, all that did is it took the U.S. from being number one in stem cell research to number eight. All the scientists, all the ideas just went to South Korea, to India, to Europe, to China. We live in a world of porous, porter, uh, of, of porous borders. You can't regulate against the technology these days. It, it develops other places, and because we're in a hyper-connected world. Um, Still there might be institutions and governments that will try to stop progress, uh, or uh, any change, because they, they, uh, they, they need the, the, the present situation to, to, to thrive. So they, they do, and, and the fact of the matter is, if you try and regulate this and try and force this, uh, I think it's going to have a long-term backlash. It's going to maybe stabilize things for a little bit, but only allow other countries and other regions of the world to pull ahead of you, and then you're paying for it later. Uh, I don't have all the answers. I don't know where we're going to go. Uh, I know that there's going to be turbulence. We're going to have robotics and artificial intelligence impacting the job market. But I also know that, you know, 150 years ago, Europe and the U.S., two-thirds of the people here were farmers. Yes. And now it's 2% because robotics have come in and, and changed that. And they came in factoring with 60%? And 60%. But these people take jobs that are very different. We are co-evolving with technology, right? You wear glasses. Other people have knee replacements. We, have, we bring technology into our bodies. And when you get in a car and you drive at 100 kilometers per hour, that's not natural. You're co-evolving with technology to do that. And so... We're going to start working with the robots. We're going to start working with AI. Still, where, where, where will the new jobs come from after the service sector has dried up? So I think that, first of all, we're going to invent new jobs constantly. We are as technology comes on, the first thing. The second thing is that we are going to start uh, individuals working with robots and AI. We're going to supplement our abilities and uplift what we can do. The third thing is, I think we're going to redefine what occupation means. Today, if I say, what is your occupation, you may say, I'm a journalist, I'm a CEO, I'm a, you know, a physician. In the future, when I say, what is your occupation, it means, how do you occupy your time? So, if all of a sudden the cost of living is dropping to zero, because that's the direction we're heading, where the cost of energy is free, the cost of water is free, the cost of food starts to reduce, the cost of health care goes towards zero. The cost of education goes towards zero. These are the things, just like the cost of information. Today, if I want, <clears throat> what's going on is these technologies are what I call demonetizing. They're taking the money out of the cost. What do I mean by this? Uh, today, if I want to long distance with my talk with my parents in Florida, I get on Skype. It's free. 
Um, you know, the uh, things like Craigslist demonetized the classified ads in the newspapers. Google has made access to information free and ubiquitous. So exponential technologies take a lot of things that used to be physical things, like a GPS on my car dashboard, and puts it in your cell phone. It's dematerialized. I don't carry a GPS or a flashlight or books or libraries of, of records. All these things are now dematerialized onto my phone. And they've also demonetized. They've either become free or very low cost. So that's the impact of technology. It's reducing the cost of living. So and you, need, you need some income. And, and, and so we're going to find out where the, we're going to be reinventing many aspects of society over the next 20 or 30 years. If the Prime Minister of the Netherlands would call you and yeah. say, you know, we got, all, we got a country full of depressed people, they don't know what to do, what, what should I do? What, what? <laughs> Tell me. So, <laughs> so first of all, uh, we're living in a time where young individuals or young-minded individuals can, uh, can build companies, products, and services that are extraordinary. The ability for an individual to start a company using cloud computing, AI, robotics, all of these, these are the things that we teach at Singularity University. Um, I'm here with Deloitte and SU and XPRIZE talking to people, uh, in the, the CEOs of these, of uh, the uh, Netherlands companies about the impact of technologies because you can and a couple of kids in a garage have the ability to start a company that only governments and large corporations could do before and today we have we're at two billion people connected on the internet around the world and we're going from two billion to five billion people three billion new minds are coming online and effectively this means that you can create a product that you can connect and market to billions of people. So it's about creating entrepreneurship. It's about creating, teaching kids that any problem that you see is a great opportunity to create a business. The world's biggest problems, food, water, shelter, energy, health care, are the world's biggest business opportunities. So you're empowered to do these things today. Still, what would you say to the Prime Minister when he calls I, I would say, number one, it's important to get people educated about the technologies that are coming online. Number two, it's about creating a culture of entrepreneurship where you can encourage people to create new products and services that can be marketed around the world. No, uh, and number three, um, it's the fact of the matter is that the world is going to be changing and that we're going to have turbulence on the way. And there are no guarantees in that regard. But for me, the world is becoming more and more capable of solving its problems. Having said that, we're going to be creating a new type of economy that's going to be very different from the way it was before and governments are going to have to adjust because the, the systems that we've had that we have in place today were designed for a year for you know a world a hundred years ago two hundred years ago when the rate of change was much slower so government has to reinvent itself too constantly constantly and that's a very difficult thing to do the they don't like that at all they don't like they like keeping things the way they are in power the rules in place but all that means is that when it breaks, it doesn't break gently. Um, you know, we have more people living to the age of 80 now and 100. The population is growing older. Number two, the rate of innovation is increasing. The number of patents being filed, the number of inventors. You know, it could be today I, put, I create an invention here in the middle of Amsterdam, and then tomorrow somebody takes my invention in Mumbai or Nigeria or wherever it might be and improves it. We have this global economy where the rate of invention is going to be increasing tenfold, a hundredfold. So the intellectual property system is going to have to change. There are lots of things that are going to be changing over the years ahead. We were talking to, we were just talking to Vincent about the article in The Economist about this car mechanic in Argentina <coughs> who developed a new way for, for giving birth to babies. Babies, I saw that. I saw that article. <laughs> It's, it's, it's incredible. So what this means, again, the notion is that more, there are more and more agents of innovation in the world, right? I, I use this as an example. A kid in Mumbai on a smartphone has access to more computing power than the government of the U.S. had going to the moon. I mean, and probably more than the U.S. government had in the 70s, maybe the 80s. And that person also has access to 3D printing for manufacturing and robotics, we're living in a world where there are more and more inventors, more and more people who can do things. Um, it's, for me, it's one of the most exciting times ever to be alive. 
There is nothing that's going to be impossible. It's a matter of the combination of passion, technology, and capital. And so for the depressed people here that you spoke about, <laughs> the technology is here, the capital is here, is about what are you passionate about? What do you want to create here? Because you can create anything. And that's the message. Stop complaining about problems and start fixing them. You chuckle a lot. Do you, if, you find that the atmosphere in the United States, in North America, Europe, and Asia is very different? So I find that um, the mindset in Silicon Valley, where Singularity University uh, lives, and we're on the NASA campus. It's partners, in the drinking water. With Google. It's in the drinking water because people realize that, listen, I'm going to try something cool, and if it fails, fine, I'll try the next thing and the next thing. There's a mindset that failure is okay, that rapid change, that failing means I'm learning. That didn't work, I'll try this. That doesn't work, I'll try this. And the notion is that uh, the rate at which you can go from I've got an idea to I'm running a billion dollar company is faster than ever, right? We have companies like Uber and Airbnb and Snapchat that are going from zero to three billion dollar valuations in two years. So listen, clearly that's not the rule, that's the exception. But the ability for people to you know, what's the number? By 2016, there are going to be a billion cell phones in Africa. A billion cell phones. Who, if I went back 20 years and spoke to Nokia and, and Motorola and, you know, Samsung and, you know, whomever it might be, and said, you're going to have a billion handsets in Africa, they would have thought I was crazy. But that's the way it is today. And besides that, I now have a billion customers I can talk to in Africa. I don't have to be Coca-Cola or Shell to have arms and legs in every country on the planet. I can be two kids in a garage here in Amsterdam with a great idea, put it on the web, and be able to reach a billion people. That's the new world we're living in. Vincent, he's my brother. He's got more, more better ideas than I have. Yeah. Um, we have exponential technologies, yeah. and our brains stay the same. Yeah. We basically were able to handle nuclear weapons, but yeah. now we're doing DNA printing. We're now going to do so many... We have so many ways to destroy society. Yeah. Why are you so optimistic? Why can we not destroy ourselves with this uh, technology? Could you answer to me, please? Yes, of course. <laughs> so, I mean, these technologies that we're using to improve the world also, of course, have the potential for danger. No question. But that's since the beginning of fire, you know, and the knife and the gun can protect you, can use you to hunt or can, can harm your neighbor. Um, what keeps me sane, what allows me to sleep at night, is that it has become harder and harder and harder to do anything in secret. Today in the world, as anything I do can be captured on camera, captured on YouTube, I leave digital footprints every time I buy something, that allows, if you would, the authorities to watch and make sure that there's no one buying these chemicals or having access to this, but that, we're only... That worries me at the same time. Uh, well, it does. Listen, the idea that people have privacy is an old idea. Oh. I think privacy is long since dead. I, people don't like hearing that, but I think the fact of the matter is, you know the Google car? Have you seen the Google car that it drives down the roads autonomously? Yes. Yes. It's yes. actually just a paper was written that it drives better than people. And it does. I've driven in it. It's a, it's a great... And most every car manufacturer is going to have autonomous cars in the next, within the next 10 years. The way those autonomous cars work is on their roof, they have something called a LIDAR, a laser imaging radar, that is looking around and sees everything around you. It sees, you know, every single object, every single person, every single car. If there's a crash, it sees exactly what happened. There's never a question of, of what crash. It sees a, a, a dog crossing the street, a person getting pickpocketed. It's imaging everything. Imagine not one of those cars, but millions of those cars driving down the road. You can't hide from that. Besides that, we're going to have people Google with Google, Google, Google Glass seeing everything. So, you know, the notion that there's privacy, I think, is an old idea. And the world is adapting. Kids today, you know, post everything. Somebody tap my shoulder. Yes. We didn't change time yet. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, you know, we're, we're running out of time. We're tinkering with everything. Oh, but, <laughs> but we we cannot change time. So time is the one constant, right? <laughs> time is the. Uh... 
Are we out of time? Yeah, we're out of time. Oh, is that the thing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> it was interesting talking to you. Thank yeah, you very thank much. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. A pleasure. Thank you very much. I hope you can make some yes. good footage out of that. Yes. I tried to ask some critical questions, but I didn't know many. No, they were, they were good <laughs> questions. <laughs> thank okay, you. thank you. All right, guys. Bye. Oké, okay, Willem, je hebt 14 minuten hem geïnterviewd. Wat, uh, wat vond je voor en, na, en, en nu na van hem? Nee. Willem, ik heb, je hebt hem nu 14 minuten geïnterviewd. Wat vond je nu van hem? Ik vond hem wel leuk. Want hij is, kijk, uh, als je hem zijn praatje hoort houden, is het nogal uh, vaak eendimensionaal. En nu laat hij ook zijn eigen twijfels zien en wat mis kan gaan en wat verkeerd kan gaan. En de, de, dus het was een wat afgewogener verhaal dan hij normaal vertelt. Tenminste, van de verhalen die ik van hem... Het was niet zo slik. Je prikkelde hem en hij ging er echt op in. Wat meer voor het Europees publiek was het. Amerikanen willen graag een, een enkelvoudig optimistisch verhaal horen. Deze 15 minuten interview, hoeveel, uh, hoe groot wordt het item op Nieuwsuur vanavond? Nieuwsuur 6, denk ik. Wat, wat worden we? 5, 6 minuten? Hoe lang wordt het? 5, 6 minuten. Een minuut of 6. Oké, okay, we gaan naar kijken. Dank je. Zo, dan krijgen we zo meteen een persconferentie en dan hebben we zo meteen het geheel... In de zaal.